I didn't know how unprepared I was for children until April and I had our first child, Phoebe. Uh, of course, this was 14 years ago, and we've had uh, four children since uh, that time, but I was completely and totally unprepared for anything. I didn't know what went on with the birth. I didn't know, uh, I didn't really know what was going to come with children when uh, we had a, a child in the house now. Uh, and the birth was especially difficult for me because when she went into labor, I had really not known exactly what was going to happen with all that. And, and we went to the hospital one day and they did a test on April and they realized that the baby needed to come right then because the, her blood pressure was too high and so they were uh, they were nervous about it so they, they said all right you're having a baby today and so I was all of a sudden it was right there in my face and I knew I had to have it so we got to the hospital and and the nurse started asking questions and one of the questions she asked me she said well how far is she dilated and I looked at her and I go there's nothing wrong with her eyes she's having a baby well of course I didn't understand that there was a different kind of dilation that she was talking about and of course being a kind nurse she said here let me show you pictures I was like oh no 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 no! don't show me all that no thanks I'll pass <laughs> well you know there really there was books and there was materials that I could have read I just didn't being a guy I figured I'd figure it out as I went uh, along uh, but I, I was totally unprepared for what was going to come for me Luckily, through the blessing, uh, April was very prepared, and so I was able to figure it out as I went. And so as our other children uh, came onto the scene, I was more prepared. I was more ready for what I was going to face. Well, God prepared David for the service that he was going to do, the fulfilling of the calling that he had on David's life. Uh, and we're going to see that preparation begin here uh, in this text uh, this morning. We're going to be looking this morning at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Ch Samuel chapter 16, and we'll start in verse 14. Of course, uh, last time we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 16, the beginning of, uh, of this story, uh, to see about how David was anointed to be the king as Saul had failed at, at, at being king that God had rejected him as king, and now he was raising up a man after his own heart who would, we would come to know uh, as David. And so uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 shows how God began to prepare David for this calling. And it starts in verse 14, and it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now let's stop there for just a second because there's a couple things that we want to grab a hold of here. First of all, it says that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now when we hear that as believers, that, that can be a little uncomfortable for us uh, anytime we hear about the spirit departing from someone uh, because we often uh, equate this with, well, I thought the Holy Spirit never left someone. I thought that once we were saved, we were always saved. Once we had Jesus as Savior, He wasn't going to leave us. And yes, that's true. And so we need to understand that the way that God filled people with His Spirit, this side of the cross and that side of the cross, are, are there's some differences uh, in there. And so to say that the Holy Spirit left Saul like he would leave somebody uh, who was a Christian, they, they're totally mutually exclusive. They don't uh, mesh with one another. That's not the idea here. In the Old Testament, when we see the Spirit of the Lord departing from someone, it means that God's Spirit is no longer with that person, blessing them, leading them in the direction that they ought to go. Saul had long since decided that his way was better than God's way, that he didn't have to obey God's rules if he didn't want to. And so he started going his own way, and as he continued to do that, eventually said, okay, God said, you are my chosen anointed one and you have turned your back on me. If you turn your back on me, I'm going to, re I'm going to remove my spirit from you. And so Saul was supposed to be that one who was the anointed one of God who was going to go out and be God's king for Israel. He chose to do it his own way and so God removed his spirit from him. So let's not mistake that this is in some way God pulling away uh, like he would pull away the Holy Spirit from someone. He doesn't do that. He's saying he's pulling away from him because Saul chose to turn his back. And he said, okay, you will no longer have my blessing. I will, never, I will no longer go before you uh, in battle or any other things. But then it says, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now, we may say, okay, 
I get it about the whole spirit, uh, God's spirit leaving him, but then God sends an evil spirit to him. Isn't that a little bit brutal? Okay, you got to understand something about the Old Testament mindset. The Old Testament mindset was that God was completely sovereign over all things. And I think that's actually a, a good mindset to have. Sometimes today we have this mindset that we, we've created God into this little God who kind of doesn't have the ability to control the things around us, that God uh, is not completely sovereign, that there's so much that he just kind of spins things in motion. We call it deism, that God just spun things in motion and then just stands back and watches. And really, God is sovereign in all things. God is above all things. And so they had the mindset that if something happened, it didn't happen outside of the divine will of God. And so as they talk about an evil spirit, this doesn't necessarily mean that God said, okay, you evil spirit, you go in and you fill Saul. Now, could that have happened? Yes. Now, that's what I, think. I thought that was the work of the devil. Nothing happens without God being in control. All we have to do is go back and look at the book of Job. Okay? Who is it that pointed Job out to the devil? It was God who did that. Have you taken Job as an example here? God is completely decided. It doesn't happen outside of the will of God. Now, could it be that the, this is saying that the evil spirit entered him and God didn't stop it from happening? Yes. But what we're going to see here is that this actually brings about God's will. And so no matter how exactly that went about, and, and in the divine counsel of things, we just don't know. What it says is that an evil spirit from the Lord, meaning that God allowed it to happen. God allowed this to come about through because it's going to fulfill his sovereign will. So uh, verse 15 and, and following, it says, And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now... An evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let, a, a, let our Lord now come command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. So... Saul's advisors see that, that he's being tormented by this evil spirit. Now exactly how did that evil spirit materialize, we don't know. It just doesn't really say. He, he, he got angry, he got uh, he's full of rage in there. There was some sort of psychological issue going on inside of Saul. And the, the best medicine of his day said, what you need is you need a musician. A musician, a musician would calm you down. Uh, they would be somebody who you could come to, or they could come to you uh, and, and, and bring you some peace. And so they decide, let's get a person who could play the lyre. The lyre was kind of like a harp, uh, and, and somebody who would come in and play music well. Saul says, sounds like a great idea. Whatever we can do uh, to get somebody to calm the spirit uh, that's within me. And so look at verse 18. It says, uh, one of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, a Bethlehemite, uh, who is, uh, is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Well, we don't know who this young man is who knew about David, but he says, hey, I know this guy. He's the son of Jesse. And, and if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 uh, through 13, you find that uh, we've already been introduced to David. David is the one who God had, uh, had Samuel anoint as the next king. So we already know this Jesse. We know something about his sons. And so somebody knew of David and he said, hey, here's the guy you want. Why? Well, because David had lots of great skills. He, had, uh, he was a musician. Okay? He was uh, skilled at playing mu uh, musical instruments, including the lyre. In fact, we, we know that David is a skilled musician today because all we have to do is look at the book of Psalms. Many of the Psalms were written by David. He was a man of music. I imagine as he was tending the flocks uh, of the sheep that, that music was a way that he could pass the time away. So he was very skilled at music. But it wasn't only that. It, he also says that he is brave. He's shown great bravery. Now, exactly how this man knew about David's bravery, we don't know. But at this time, David was no doubt renowned for being a brave man. He was also a warrior. He was somebody who was ready for battle. Uh, he had proven that as he was tending uh, the flocks and that he was 
ready for, uh, for a battle. He was also a good speaker. He, he was good with his, uh, with his words. He, he was able to express what he felt and what he thought in words. And he was also good looking. Now we may say, well, what, wait a minute. It says here uh, that, that he was a man of good presence. Why does that matter? Uh, well, it mattered very much in the king's court at that time. The, court wa uh, the king wanted to surround himself, and kings have typically wanted to surround themselves with people who uh, raise up the, uh, the, the, the level of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, let's just say that we're eye candy in, in essence, because it, in, to them, with better looking people around them, they look better also. They had gorgeous people around him. David was all of these things. He was a musician. He was brave. He was a warrior. He was a good speaker. And he was good looking. However, the greatest thing of all is the last thing that is said uh, about him. That the Lord is with him. That the Lord is with him. That really is the key one. The Lord is with him. This is where Saul should have been. It should have been said about Saul that the Lord is with him. But he, he would have. He, he wasn't. Okay? He could have been that guy. Saul could have by his own choice, but he rejected the leadership of the Lord. And in the end, that rejecting of the leadership of the Lord cost him his kingdom. So what this man notices is you see, David has all of these skills, but the greatest of all is that the Lord is with him. The Lord's spirit has rested upon uh, him. Uh, and so... It goes on here uh, in, in verse uh, 19, and he says, Send me David, your son, uh, or it says, Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. Well, how did, how did Saul know about this particular guy? Well, it's, it's probably that guy. Oftentimes in Scripture, we're like, we, we see things like this, and all, all this guy said was, a, a, a son of, uh, of Jesse, that it, it, it's a son of Jesse who uh, is going to be the one who plays. Um, and sometimes it, it, it won't give us the, all the information, it'll just give us a little bit of information. However, and I think actually more likely, the reason for him knowing who David was is because this story actually takes place after Goliath. Now we may say, but wait a minute. Goliath happens in chapter 17, and this is in chapter 16. How can that be possible that this happened after? Well, for us as modern Americans, chronology means a lot. That this happened after this, after this. But in the, old, uh, in the ancient world, chronology didn't mean as much. They oftentimes would put things together because they were thematically uh, compatible, not because they particularly followed a chronology. So it's very likely that David was anointed and then he battled Goliath, which proved that he was brave and that he was a warrior. And then we see that this is happening. That would be the chronology uh, that's very likely here. Now, is that for sure? We don't know. But that's probably the most likely story on how it is that Saul knew who David was. And he says, send me uh, David. So we go on in verses 20 through 23. Look at what it says. It says, and Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent uh, to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the evil spirit of God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it in his hand. So Saul was refreshed. And, uh, and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So Jesse sent David to, uh, to King Saul, and he sends him a gift. Uh, the reason for sending him these gifts was uh, to honor the king. And, and if you went to go see the king, you wanted to honor him. It's no different than if we went to see uh, the president of the United States. Now, no matter what your politics are, I would hope that if you went to see the president, that you would be very cordial and kind and maybe even would give some sort of gift. It's not so much to honor the man as it is to honor the position. And really, we get too caught up in the politics today and not realize that, that whether you like the president or not, the president is the leader of our country. He is the representative of our country, for better or for worse, and we need to honor that position. And in honoring that position, we also need to honor the man. And so that's what Jesse does with King Saul here. 
Uh, and then it says Saul loved David. Now we may say, well, wait a minute. We're going to see that Saul's going to really mistreat David. How, how can it be that he loved him? What it means is that, that Saul saw David as very useful. Okay? He saw him as very useful to him. That, that he was somebody who added a lot to his kingdom. Not only was he able to, to bring him a, a peace and calm, but he had all of these other incredible traits. And so uh, David, uh, Saul loved him in that he, he really liked having him around. Okay? This wasn't a, de a deep kind of love emotion like I might have with my wife or, or with my children. It is this, this, I really like what this guy brings to uh, the table here. Uh, and so he made him his armor bearer. Now the armor bearer was an important position uh, in the ancient world. It was one who not only would bring the king his armor, but he would also help put him on there, uh, and he would actually carry his sword for him. The armor bearer was a, a, a was a, a, a person who was greatly trusted by the king. Okay? To make that uh, somebody the armor bearer, you, you wanted somebody that you trusted. They would, they would be somebody who was supposed to be by your side even at battle. They were going to be there for you through thick and thin. In fact, we're going to see as we get towards the end of Saul's life that his armor bearer, not David, a different armor bearer, was there by his side when he died and his armor bearer even killed himself once he saw that Saul had killed himself. So, so the, the armor bearer, the reason why this is mentioned here is, is not so much to give us an idea of what the ancient armor bearers did, but more so to focus on the fact that Saul, that Saul trusted David to the point where he put him in this very highly sought after, highly important position. Uh, and so it says that, that here that, uh, so whenever the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and he played it with his hand. Now we may say, well, was David just that good of a musician? Was he just that good at his instrument, his lyre, that man, he could just drive that evil spirit away? Boy, that guy could play. Well, well, the reality is, is that no, that's not the case. David probably was a great musician. In fact, we see from the Psalms that he was an incredibly, incredibly good with words uh, and, and musical words, especially. But really, what we need to recognize is that that important part that we looked at just a second ago. The Lord was with him. It was the Lord who was doing this work, and David recognizes that. Which really brings us to our big idea, uh, and that is in a form of a question. How does God equip David for his future calling? What we see in this text is we see some ways that God equips David for his future calling. And that's an important thing for us to grab a hold of because as we see that, God is constantly at work in his people, preparing his people for what he calls them to. God will never call us to do something that he has not prepared us for or is going to prepare us for as we fulfill the calling. God is not going to say, I'm going to call you to do something that you can't possibly do. That's not who God is. And so we see that he indeed prepares David for his future calling. First way we see he does that is God providentially brings David to the king's court. Okay? Don't miss this. This is something that we can get so focused on David's skill set that we miss the fact that it was God who brought David to his court, uh, to, David, to Saul's court in the first place. Okay, This is a time of training for David. Okay? This is important for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is because it's a time of training for David. David was going to be in that throne at some point. He was going to be king at some point. And so he needed to see the good things that Saul did, but he also needed to see the mistakes that Saul made and the failures that Saul made. It's a time of training. I think as I look back at, at my pastoral ministry experience, I had a great experience at seminary, but while I was in seminary, I also had an opportunity to serve at a church in Everett, uh, Washington, and an opportunity to, to serve at a church in Corvallis, Oregon. And at both of those churches, I had the opportunity to, wa to work with and to watch pastors who were the lead pastors. I was also the, always the associate pastor uh, before I came here to Star Road. Uh, and so I had an opportunity to watch and learn. And, and that was as much education, if not more, than I got into seminary because I got to watch. Now, the pastors didn't always sit down and say, now, when you run into this situation, do this or do that. A lot of it I got by observing, by watching. When I watched 
Don Reeves from Grand Avenue uh, do some, some things within leadership. Sometimes I'd go, oh, I'm not sure I'd handle things that way. Then I became a senior pastor and I realized that, wow, he actually had a lot of really good ideas that I, didn't, uh, that I never really appreciated when I was working on them. Other times I'd see, wow, I love how he handled that situation and it's helped to educate me on how I can do that uh, in, in my own leadership. And so I learned a lot more just from observing and watching. And David is experiencing the same thing. He is there in the king's court and he can observe and he can watch. He can be trained for what his future is going to be. And, and a lot of it is so that he doesn't repeat the same mistakes of Saul. It also helps David make a name for himself. David uh, needs to have a name. He couldn't come king and uh, nobody know who he is. He gets a name for himself because he's talented, he's skilled. We're going to see as we continue on in this study that he also was a great warrior for Saul. And so he becomes to, he gets a name for himself. And it also puts David in a place where he will eventually come into conflict with Saul. Now we might say, wait a minute, I get the first two there. But why is this a good thing that he's going to be in a situation where he comes into conflict with Saul? Well, oftentimes we approach conflict as something that we need to avoid at all costs. And people who try to look for conflict, usually we want to avoid those type of people. But the reality is, is that oftentimes conflict helps us to become more of the people that we ought to be. None of us say, yay, more conflict, bring on conflict. But the reality is, is that a lot of times that conflict helps to mold us into what we need to be, how we need to live. It helps us to recognize things that we might not recognize without that conflict. David needed to come into conflict with Saul. Part of the reason that he needed to come into conflict with Saul is to bring about God's will, bring about Saul coming to the end of his kingship uh, and David rising to that uh, area of king. But I also believe that one of the reasons that, that he needed to come into this conflict with Saul is because it needed to kill the King Saul that was within him. This is not my own idea. This comes from a writer named Gene Edwards uh, from a book called The Tale of Three Kings. And it's a fascinating book. I would really highly recommend anybody uh, uh, looking at that book, uh, reading that book. It's a very good, uh, very good book. But one of the things that he posits in there, and I agree 100%, is that for David... Uh, to just not come into that conflict, he would have probably been King Saul II. Once King Saul died, he probably would have just followed suit with King Saul. But going into the conflict and facing all of the struggles that he faced, God used that as a time is to mold David into who he would be and also to kill the King Saul within him so that he wouldn't just repeat the same mistakes of Saul before. So the first thing that we saw here was that God providentially brought David to the king's court. The next we find out here is that God takes David's skills and makes them effective for service. He took the skills that David already had, but he makes those effective for service. David had some natural talents and some developed skills. He had natural talents. He was, he was good looking. Okay? That's a natural talent. He didn't would do something to make. He's just something that just, it just happened. Okay? Uh, he was a good speaker. That was probably something that he developed over time. But who knows? It could be something that he uh, was, uh, was born. We just don't know. Okay? But, but he had these natural talents. He had these developed skills. But they only became totally effective for ministry through God's empowerment. It was God's empowering David's natural skills and his developed talent that helped them to be effective for ministry. It was only through God's empowerment that that was going to happen. While those natural talents and developed skills would have served David well throughout his life, especially as king, to be truly effective, he would need to first and foremost be a man that it could be said that the Lord is with him. Okay? And so it was only through the Lord's empowerment, as we saw as we looked in chapter 16, that God was on with David in a special way. In fact, let's just go look back at that text real quickly um, uh, of what, uh, and it says uh, in verse 13 of chapter 16, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David 
from that day forward. The Spirit of the Lord was on David in a very special way because this was the man after God's own heart that God had raised up to be a king for him, for his purpose. We can never lose sight of the significance of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon his people. Okay? This is not simply a case of God using a, personal, personal's, a person's natural talents and ability, though those things are important. What it really is is God empowering his people to do what they could never do on their own. And that's the important point to pick up. Okay? David couldn't be the king that he needed to be on his own. Even with all of the talents that he had and all of the skills, he can never be that person without God empowering him to do it. God helping him to fulfill. So what does this mean for us? What does all this story about David mean for us? How do we take this personal? Well, the reality is that God equips us also to fulfill our calling. We all have a calling on our life too. And though it's different than the calling that was on David's life, we still have a calling, each and every one of us. God brings his people to the places that he would have us to grow and to be of service to him. First way that God equips us to, to, to fulfill the calling is that he brings us to places that he would have us to grow and be of service to him. Okay. Now this doesn't necessarily mean it's where we want to be. Okay? doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be where we want to be. God doesn't always bring us to the place that we want to be. It, it, wouldn't it be nice if we could just say, okay, God, here's the script for my life. Just go ahead and follow that. I had a friend of mine who, when I was uh, surrendering to the call of ministry, he said, well, what kind, of, uh, what kind of a church do you want to be in? And, of course, I laid out this church that was successful, loved my family, was, was growing, that all these exciting things were happening uh, that was going to be a great place for me to be at. And he looked at me and goes, what if God called you to a place that would be hurtful to you and painful to you? Would it be any less of God's calling? It's like, oh man, I never thought of it that way. The reality is, is that wherever God sends us, he's calling us to grow and to be molded more and to be his people. We don't get to determine where those places are going to be. God's the one who decides that doesn't it always mean that we will know why God brought us to those places either. Okay? It, wouldn't it be nice if God would just say, okay, here's why I'm sending you to all these places. He doesn't, though. Sometimes we just, we just have to trust Him. We just have to go on faith. We just have to go to wherever God is calling us to do to go, recognizing that, that He's going to bring us to the places that we need to be at. But He's not always going to explain why, especially in the midst of it. I found that I've uh, not always understood why God had me go through circumstances until I got to the end of it, and I could look back and go, oh, now I get it. Now I understand why you sent me down this road. It also doesn't always mean that we will be in a place of influence. Okay? David was certainly in a place of influence. He, he was the armor bearer. He was this very important place. But it doesn't always mean that we personally are going to be in a place of great influence and important, okay? What it does mean, though, is that his purposes for our life are important nonetheless. No matter what his purpose is for us, it is important. And we have some general purposes that all of us have as believers. We're all to worship him, okay? We're all to grow in Christ's likeness, to be more and more like Jesus. We're to serve him. We're to tell other people the good news about Jesus. We're to show love to others. All of these things are things that we're supposed to do, but we're not always going to understand exactly all the reasons, but understanding that God is molding us into who he wants us to be. Another way that God equips us is that God takes our gifts, skills, and passions and uses those for effective ministry. God takes those gifts that we have, when we talk about gifts, I'm talking about spiritual gifts that he has given to us. A lot of times we try to look at the list of spiritual gifts in the Bible and, and think that those are all encompassed. And really what a spiritual gift is, is that when God gifts you to fulfill the work that he's called you to do. Okay? That, that's what God's spiritual gifting is. All of us have been given spiritual gifts. Every Christian has a spiritual gift. You may have one, you may have multiple, but all of us have spiritual gifts. 
God has also given us some skills. When I talk about skills, I'm talking about things that usually we've developed over time. This can happen through education. It can happen through experience. When I was young uh, and I got out of high school, I didn't jump right into college. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so I went and I worked in, with my dad, and he taught me how to run a print a printing press. And so I ran printing presses for a number of years. And so that's a skill that I have. I know how to not only uh, work on a printing press, I can take a printing press part and put it back together for the most part. Okay? So that's a skill that I learned as I developed. It's not particularly a spiritual gift. It's something that I've developed and I've learned. I went to, to seminary and I learned a lot of things about biblical hermeneutics and exegesis and, and the history of the English Bible and these, these skills that I've developed over time uh, through study and through training. We all have those things. Some of those things we can see some very clear spiritual correlation. Other times, not so much. But God can use all of those things for us to fulfill His will. And then all of us have things that we're passionate about, things that just drive us, things that we love. One of the things that I just love is I love watching my kids play sports. Now, I sometimes can get a little overboard about it, you know, yelling at referees and, 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 and living or dying on how they, uh, uh, how they perform. But the reality is, is they, you know, I got to keep that in check. But, but all of us have things that we're passionate about. I'm passionate about uh, sports, especially my kids uh, playing sports. Things that just, it's easy to get excited about. I don't, you don't have to try to convince me to get excited about my daughter's upcoming basketball game. I'm already excited. I've been excited about it for a week and a half. I can't wait. That's passion. That's what we're excited about. God often uses these tools that we have, these, these gifts, these skills, and these passions uh, to help us to be able to serve Him and to show people his love. He, he often uses these things. He uses the ways that he's gifted us. He's used, he uses the skills that we have. He uses the passions that we have. Uh, uh, just as one example, I've had some great opportunities through my kids' uh, sports experiences, especially basketball, to be able to share Jesus with people, to be able to get involved in people's lives. Those are tools that God has used. So, uh, I'm not going to say he put the love for basketball in there. He uses the fact that I enjoy the sport of basketball as a way to be able to get involved in people's lives who also enjoy the game as much as I do. So the important thing for us to grab here is that God equipped David to fulfill his calling, and God is today equipping you and I to fulfill the calling that he has on our life. And beloved, that is a great great word for us to know because our God is still actively involved in our lives. He hasn't taken his spirit away from us. He's still at work in our lives. And that's a word of encouragement. Let's pray.